Welcome to They That Hope with Father Dave and Deacon Bob, seeing humor and hope in a crazy world. And And Bob had the best Sunday ever. I tried. You had the best Sunday ever. I tried. Open up with liturgy, celebrate the Eucharist in the morning, and then go and spend the day at the park with your kids. I went to the vigil mass. Um, So... I was all in. I even bought... I I apparently own more Pittsburgh Pirates gear than you do. Yep. What's with the Blue Rays shirt? Blue Rays? What are, I don't care what they are. Mm. Blue Jays? Yeah. Okay. I have all kinds of... I, I go to... <laughs> if ML- the Toronto team ever moved to Tampa, they'd be called the Blue Rays. I would say two-thirds of my shirts are from um, MLB.com um, clearance. <laughs> but they, they've got really nice... I like... Um, some of the Nike dry fit shirts because they're okay. easy to fold and yeah. they travel really well. So I have probably 12, 10, 12 MLB shirts. But I, <laughs> it was funny because my nephew <laughs> texted me before the game. He said, Uncle Dave, could you bring me any extra Pittsburgh Pirate swag? And it's like, I have, I have, I have no Pittsburgh Pirate Literally swag. Literally nothing. So being just the sports fan that I am, I actually stopped by on a, a sports store on the way down there and got a T-shirt and a hat. So I was I was rocking the you look. Were rocking I was rocking the look, yep. and uh, it was a rain delay. It was because it was drizzling. Yep. And you know those are those are professional athletes. They have families. They yep. need to take care of themselves. Yep. You don't want to get hit by a ball in the face. That's right. So um, then my favorite moment was it stopped raining after two hours. Yep. Never really was raining hard in the beginning. They take off the tarp, and then somebody comes out with a with a hose, and he starts hosing down. Yeah. What? It just rained. They covered the tarp so they because they want their water on. I can explain it. It will never make sense to you. Great. I, I don't care. So then the game happened, and that, of course, is always the most unfortunate part about a beautiful day. And uh, the Pirates lost 10-1. to 1. Yep, but your son had a blast. Oh, I, I had a great time with I him. I ended up running into both of your children. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was fun. Yeah, I went yeah. with my son, one of Aiden. Them, the older one was a little frustrated that you didn't seem to mention him on the podcast. I didn't. So just a shout-out to John and his fiance Jocelyn. All four of us there you go. Much went better, much better. to the game. Well, they went separately, so we met them at the game. And we had, we had I thought I got great seats. It's, yeah, yeah. You yeah I was, like, right behind the dugout. I tried my best. I yeah. just want to say... I tried my best, and uh, the and baseball let me down. Even with the shot clock, I know it's not called a shot clock, but that's what I'm just going to call it. Even with the shot clock, it still went really late because it started two hours. Yeah, you know, it was it was great. So I went with my nephew and a couple of students, and we had a blast. My nephew was so funny on the way home from the game. He goes, "You know, Uncle Dave, it was just really fun." And uh, he said, "As soon as I walk into the park, it's like." Why don't I do this more? I always love to go to the games. Mm. It's, it was fantastic. Yeah. It wasn't a great game though. Although the pitcher for the you Blue Jays, think? he's five and zero. Oh. He's okay. not lost yet. Yeah. So he's he's you know he's having a good year. No, it wasn't a great game, but it was a great day. Was well, you know, I actually did have a lot of fun, uh-huh. and it would have been more fun if I well. I, I'm actually jesting. You know, the, the ballpark is beautiful. It is. Uh, my it, is son, it is beautiful. My son had an awesome time. Uh, both my sons had awesome times. And uh, and he got his picture taken with a pierogi, which was a He got his picture taken with a pierogi. If you're not familiar, a, and I'm sure, I'm sure everybody is familiar, so it's not like I'm not <laughs> telling you something you don't know, but they have the great pierogi race, which yes. is about six people dressed up in and giant pierogies. massive pierogies and they just running run. around the stadium. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great event. You know what would have made it just a little bit better if they would have, if the whole team would have had coordinated dances after strikeouts and this is like not that. balloon ball banana ball whatever whatever let's do a quick update because there are other exciting games mm-hmm. going on in the world uh, just a shout out to nhl fans in the west looks like the kraken are doing pretty well Good. that's a that's a newer nhl team in seattle they're they're up the stars 2-1 uh where the vegas golden knights who i'm going to rant about gambling in a second uh, are up the Oilers 2-1. And in the East, here's the shock. The Florida Panthers are up 3 nothing to the poor Toronto Maple Leafs. Wow. Toronto's playing really well. Toronto's playing really well. Toronto, you know, slayed the demon of getting out of the first round, and they're now just the sacrificial offering to the Florida Panthers. Meanwhile, Carolina is up 2-1. In NBA action, though, that's where the real excitement is happening. Uh, the good news is the Miami Heat are up on the Knicks 3-1, to one, treating them as badly as the Knicks treated my beloved Cavs. Uh, the Boston 
The Celtics 76ers uh, game is uh, series is tied 2-2. That's really exciting. Another very exciting series has been the Nuggets two, two. and the Suns. 2-2, two, two. yep. Yep. It is. yep. Yeah. And then the Lakers are up 3-1? Yeah, baby. That's unbelievable. Yeah. I'm really surprised. I'm really excited about that. Actually, one of the... So the Suns-Lakers would be a fun series. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, it's either. I think the Lakers are going to get out of the Warriors series. I hope so. Yeah. I think I don't think the Warriors are done yet, but I mean it's pretty confident. Miami. No, that's fair. Miami's definitely getting out yeah. of. Uh, is going to go to the Eastern Conference Finals, and it's a it's a coin toss to know if it's the Celtics or the Seventy Sixers. I would. I'll bet you they don't get it. Bet you. Bet. Bet. Oh, that's what yes. we're talking about. That's what we're going to talk about. So anyway, basketball. Woo woo! It's all good. Um. Yes, I want Bob, to talk Bob's about. Got a, Bob, I, I'm Bob's actually got an angry. Issue. I, do, I have an issue. issue. No, no, this is. <laughs> he walked in and he goes, "We were talking about what we're going to talk about." He goes, "Well, I know what I want to talk about." <laughs> He's like, "What do you want, want to talk about?" Talk I'm about like, "We're going to talk about this. We are absolutely going to talk about this because it's driving me absolutely crazy." Um, so you might have seen some of the news that there's uh, there's been some athletics players. Okay, most people have not seen. Okay, that. so uh, at least in the NFL, a number of players were suspended for gambling. Now, I think we are used to hearing this in sports. You, Pete Rose, for example. Atta boy, atta boy. That's right. Way to go, Bobby. Uh, Cincinnati Reds. Way to Bobby. Should be a Hall of Famer. Bob. But he gambled. I know, right? He had a gambling. I don't know if he had a gambling problem. Oh, I'd say he had a gambling problem. Did he, okay, you can yeah. say more, than, the you day, can say more well, about the, that. The day that the uh, Hall of Fame was talking about his issue, he was in Vegas doing some Selling and gambling stuff. Okay. Yeah, he, had gambling he might have issues. a gambling problem. Yeah. Now, I think we can all agree, at least in terms of athletes, that if a if a person is gambling on a, a sport they're playing, yeah. and especially if they're gambling on their game, yeah, against themselves, I bet you we're going to lose. That's a that's, that's, a, that's a bad sight. But um, these guys weren't even gambling. I mean, these NFL players that just got suspended. I mean, the NFL season wasn't even happening. They were betting on other sports. Uh, other sports. And so real quick, is the policy that if you're a professional athlete, you cannot bet on any sports? Okay, this is where it gets dumb. Okay. The policy d- goes from league to league. Okay. With the NFL, okay. if you are a professional athlete, you are not allowed to make bets on the property of the training grounds. Oh, so you can walk across the, the street and make a bet. So their problem was they were weightlifting. They pulled out their DraftKings app and they started talking and making some bets. Huh. And they got suspended and fined. Now, some of them was a little bit more serious because there was some evidence that they might have been betting on NFL games, which you're also. But it, here's the thing: so now all Draft the sports Kings gives NFL millions of dollars, uh, billions, okay, uh, billions. And so you're you're getting into bed with these casino companies, and you're trying to get the rest of the world to start gambling. But then your own players, you're like, oh, how dare you? You're like, you can't, you can't do that. And, I mean, that's just... Integrity of the game. Integrity of the game. Okay, right. so, but I, the question is, gambling objectively, you, you had, did you, do you still have the catechism? I do. Reference? So okay. so let's just talk about gambling in general, yeah. because I think it's something that confuses a lot of It's a very a popular thing. I mean, yeah. honestly, truth be told, um, I, I was going to say all my nephews. I don't know that that's fair. But they've got a little account, maybe with DraftKings, and, right. and they maybe will spend 5 or $10 a week. A week. It's yeah. not like... But it... It provides them kind of interest in the game and more cheering and all that kind of thing. So, I mean, I know a lot of people, yes, especially now with DraftKings and all those kinds of things. Again, I don't, I don't, I don't know if anyone who's got a major problem, but five, ten bucks on a weekend, it's fairly common hearing people talk about it. Whereas years ago, you never would have heard about this kind of thing. Well, because it was illegal. Yeah, and well, there was, and yeah, and you'd have to go certain places, but right, right, and you know that kind of made it like a little bit more shady. Yeah, you yeah. Know, like you really have to go out of your way to do it. All right, here's what the Catechism says about it. This is uh, twenty four thirteen in the Catechism. Games of chance, parenthetically described as card games, etc., or wagers are not in themselves contrary to justice. Now, I'll by the way, you, this I'll is bet you they are <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, they're. Um, this is in the section of the Catechism under Thou Shalt Not Steal, which is an interest, which is a fascinating section of the Catechism. Many yeah. people think Thou Shalt Not Steal. It's just, I'm going to It's s- easy. Steal We're done. Reese's Peanut Butter right. Cup. Right. But done. really, it talks about um, social justice, fair mm-hmm. wages, mm-hmm. Uh, care of money, care of creation. Copyright. All, all of mm-hmm. those things that are there. Predators. So it goes on to say, they become morally unacceptable when they deprive someone of what is necessary to provide for his needs and those of, of others. The passion for gambling risks becoming an enslavement. Unfair wagers and cheating at games constitute grave matter unless the damage inflicted is so slight 
that the one who suffers it cannot reasonably consider it significant. So when you and I were playing Uno and, and you might have cheated, that would not be grave matter. It was not grave matter. Okay, great. It was not grave matter. It's interesting because um, like La- Las Vegas, there's a lot of things in Las Vegas that are just really, really dark. So some people have this attitude that Las Vegas is inherently e- evil. But then you also get into the whole issue about, you know, s- you're supporting some things that are in organizations like when the mob was running, yeah. you know, all these things. So I know that my parents, and, and I've been in Vegas over the years, I don't know how many times. And honestly, we've played games, um, craps, it's a, it's a dice game. Mm-hmm. My family and I, we've, we've had so many times of just laughing and just having a blast with it. But I think part of the problem is, is w- what you made reference is, if an individual is, w- what was the actual line about? You're actually betting money that, that you don't have or that should be going somewhere else to help your family. Yeah, or something it like deprives that. someone of yeah, what is necessary yeah, right. to provide for his needs and right. those of others. Right, right, right. So if, if your responsibility in your family and you're spending $500 or something like that and, and your kids need that, that, that gets where it's messed up. And it even makes reference that the, the addictive nature of it, yes. that, that there's a real danger to become addicted to it. Because there is something kind of, well, you were talking about that. It's built, many of the slot machines and stuff are built to... Try to addict yeah, you. and this is where um, this is where I think it really gets evil. And I I would probably be a little bit on a different side of it than you, Father Dave. In that I I I feel like the organizations that promote gambling, even there's a level of gambling which is and wagers which I think is okay. I'll bet but, you it's not. Well, <laughs> it might not be, but you I would say that. Uh, oh yeah, I see what you did there. Um, but they're not making their money off of the small casual wagers of people that are just having a good time. They're, mm-hmm. they're making their money off of people that they are hoping to addict to their product. And I think particularly when you look at casinos and slot machines, I was reading a book uh, that Michael Gormley uh, recommended to me, which is usually a bad start. For, you know, but this <laughs> Gomer. was Gomer, um, The World Beyond Your Head. And uh, it was a fascinating book because it talked about addiction and how uh, casinos – have hired psychologists. These psychologists, I think, are going to burn in a certain circle of hell because their expertise is on addiction and how to get people addicted Mm -hmm. to things. And uh, like the slot machines in a lot of gambling places actually have cameras that watch your facial movement. The the, The goal of the machine is to get you to think you are just about to win. And because nowadays they have these cards that you slide, you know, you, you don't usually put coins in it. Right, right, you know, they're, they're, so they're tracking you. And actually, they're going to make sure you do better every time you play to give you a sense of false mastery over uh, what you're doing, to make you think that there's some level of skill that you are developing. And it just and you're always going to lose. I mean, you look at casinos. Have you ever seen like a rundown casino? They're gorgeous. You know, the house oh. always wins. Where are they making these money yeah, off yeah, of? No, no, they're no. making it off of people. Now, the more, the more relevant thing, I think, for our listeners, though, is a lot of these apps that are out there, these yeah. app games that exact have, like, same. purchasing inside them, they are created with the exact same technology. My wife got trapped up in this. She started playing this game. It was about pandas. I don't know what it was. It was save the pandas. You had to do hit little things, and you save little baby pandas. So she was excited about it. She was playing it. You know, she likes playing games every once in a while, but she was suddenly, like, playing it all the time. Yeah. I was like, oh, that's interesting. And then I started getting bills from um, Apple Panda saying Express. like, yeah, right, exactly. You know, you know, one ninety nine, five ninety nine, six ninety nine, twelve ninety nine. Whoa, hey Jen, what's going on here? Just I'm just playing. It's just it's I just enjoy this game. Oh, oh, okay. This is around the time that Gomer pointed me out to this book. So I read it and I was like, oh my gosh! Like they created this game to addict my wife into thinking she had some kind of level of mastery, which she didn't. It's just, you know. Especially with electronic stuff, it's all fixed. Yeah, like yeah, there's yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. like at least with maybe with craps. Now I know there's ways to weight dice and do stuff like that, but or card games, or there card is a games, level of expertise. There's a it. level that you there's actually not a huge level of expertise. Not a so huge a one. <laughs> no, there's no level of it. You're just really just pulling, but it gives you the sensation yeah, that yeah. you have a level of it. That's part of the addiction of it. And anyway, long story short, I read this chapter. I showed it to her, and then I showed her the bill from Apple, and she was horrified that she had easily spent that much money over a short period of time. But I know others that really, I mean, again, the evil part of it is there's, there's people that are like, we're going to addict you to this, and we're going to take your money. 
Yeah, I'll bet you that's not true. Oh okay, gosh. maybe say the oh name of the gosh. book again because I think you you missed the reference. world beyond your head. One of our listeners needs to hear this today. God bless you. D- delete the app on your phone, okay? Like, it's not a good thing. Well, I thought we were going to a different place. Uh, no, you're are right. we going to get sponsored by yeah, DraftKings? Yeah, yeah. Like, no, you're absolutely right, on? though. It is it the, the whole the whole movement, the whole everything it's about to get you the next one you're going to win. Yes. The next, whatever it is, the, your apps, the games, gambling, all that. So well, and as these... Just say no. As That's the gambling stuff say. starts out, they're always like, $500 for yeah, the yeah, first... Yeah, for free. And I remember my son being like, cash. whoa, $500. And I'm like, right. So if they feel like they can give you $500, guess how much money they think they're going to get from you yeah. over the next few years. It is... Um, I feel like This was our largest in, uh, open ever. We've almost been 15 minutes. I wanted it to be the second section. Okay. But I just want to close with, I think it's actually going in sports, and I'm really worried about it. Okay. Hey, summer's right around the corner, and that means it is almost time for the Steubenville Youth Conferences. Woo! Yippee. We have four youth conferences here at Franciscan University, plus many more throughout North America. Your teams will spend a weekend hearing from amazing speakers, like me. Yep. Man. And you? Yep. Enjoying powerful worship from John Paul. And just having fun with other high schoolers. But most of all, they'll have a powerful encounter with Jesus Christ. There's still time to sign up your teams or youth group. You can register and find out more at studentbookconferences.com slash youth. That's studentbookconferences.com slash youth. And please like, come. Please come. Did you get a, an email? Yes, I got an email. Most I, important email we've ever got. The most important email that we've ever gotten. And it, oh, hey, come back, email. Where are you? It's from a fan. It's a huge, a huge fan. fan. Huge I like fan. to call her Margie. That's but, my little nickname for but, her. But other people call her Margie. Or mom is what I call her. Yeah, maybe you call her that. Uh, this was very sweet. I'm reading Between the Savior and the Sea, which is a novel I wrote about St. Peter, the life of St. Peter. It's an absolute gift. It brings to mind so much of The Chosen, and then she says, I think Dallas Jenkins dipped into it for content. He's the creator of The yep. Chosen. Uh, I'm not legally allowed to say anything right now. We're in the middle of <laughs> uh, negotiations, and I'll just have to ask you to respect the silence uh, for me and my family in this difficult time. Just wanted you to know how much I am loving it. Oh, she said, by the way, glad to see you enjoying baseball. Father Dave and I had a, a beautiful picture during the yeah. rain delay yeah. where yeah. I was filled with joy. Yeah, filled with joy. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Margie. It, uh, actually, writing that novel uh, was a real profound experience uh, for me. Yeah, I, and I'm so... And it's available at Amazon.com. Okay, my mother has been talking about this every time we've talked for the last several days. So oh, is that I, right? I'm glad that she's shared this with you. Oh, yeah, so, that's so sweet. But, but one of the things I was thinking of is just the process of writing a book. Hmm. So you said it was a moving experience. What was, th- was, what was that process for you? Like, did you, you obviously went into it, I'm going to write a book. Yes. Or was it just? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I went into it. Well, it's interesting. I was really encouraged um, by, do you know Bert Gezi? I do. He's a publisher. He's written many books. And just a great dude. So um, I wrote a book for him when I started youth ministry. He was working at our Sunday visitor uh, called Basic Spiritual Workout. And it was tough to write a book while I was doing um, youth ministry, but I got through it. And Bert was just amazingly complimentary as to my writing and that I was a good writer and I had a gift for it. And that wasn't something I ever thought of myself as mm-hmm. a writer, as an author. Like that just kind of, I was a musician, right? You know, that was, that was my gift. Mm-hmm. And so at one point, um, Bert was at a conference a few years later and Bert said, so what are you writing? And I said, well, not much, nothing really. And we were at a table with people and I could tell he was like a little bit like, hmm? But um, then the meeting started and things happened. And later on in the weekend, he finally like cornered me, like actually cornered me. And he said, you have to write. You have a gift. You're wasting your gift. I was like, what? And it was really sweet. I mean, he was a little angry, but it made me recognize, oh, okay. And then I thought, well, what do I want to write? And I always wanted to write a novel. So I, uh, and because since in many of my parish missions, I talk about the life of St. Peter, I thought, well, wouldn't that be cool if I tried to bring the gospel to life. That's a passion of mine, and St. Peter is uh, just close to my heart and a passion. So I, I started to write this novel, and I sent Bert some drafts of it. And he wrote back, and he said, 
you've clearly never written a novel before. <laughs> <laughs> and that actually brought me on an interesting path of starting to read about how to write novels, reading lots of other novels. Uh, and I mean, it was a many, many year process. And I would say there was something very contemplative about writing, mm -hmm. about praying with the scriptures, about putting words on the page, about finding the right way to articulate things. And uh, it was a gift. I mean, I would say that book, Between the Savior and the Sea, of I've, I've gotten to create a number mm -hmm. of wonderful mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. but it's it's really up there at the top. The uh, the the feed, I, I wrote it, gosh, almost 15 years ago, mm -hmm. and it's still word of mouth, blessing people. So, uh, mm -hmm. by the way, just a shout out to all you listeners that keep giving away copies. I mean, I have our, our secretary here, the theology secretary, she says every year she buys 10 copies, oh, and she fun. just gives them to family members and people, and um, it's just a real gift. But I think in you know, the bigger picture, uh, I'm now working on a new book, which is not a novel. It's about youth ministry, mm -hmm. and you've written a number of books mm -hmm. yourself. How mm -hmm. many books have you written? Six. Oh, wow. Yeah, I see. This would, I think I've only written like three. Well, yeah. one, the novel, which is kind of in its own category, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then um, and It's one of books. those things, the same thing that I never, yeah, my sister says that. I'm I'm not sure if I'm more amazed, Dave, that you wrote a book or you read a book. So that's that's lovely, you yeah. know. But uh, it's not it's not something that I ever really thought. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna. It wasn't a goal of mine, right, to write a book. And I remember it was the first. Well, the first one I did was the 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 master of called Rocked by God. Oh, but it was I, really the story about youth conferences. Yeah, yeah, it was just yeah. kid stories. But Who published that? Was that you? We did that at the university. Oh, the university. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought it was you press. No, Remember uh, you press? Yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> uh, Shout out to I, Paul Lauer, wherever you are. Yeah, so, and then, and then I, I remember I was just talking about freedom and just how the scripture, and somebody said to me, you should write some of that down. Yeah. And that was really the beginning. So the, the way I express it is that there's just kind of, it sounds weird, but there's just something in you yeah. that needs to come out. Yes. You know, in, in, it, in my experience, it's just that, that process of writing and, and praying over and bringing clarity to. Somebody explained one time, and, and please, I'm not the one who said this, so we don't have to get the angry email. Uh, it's like giving birth, that, that you're, you're kind of um, holding it close to yourself and then eventually giving it away to others. Yeah. But it's it's a process, um, you know. Every time I say, "Okay, I'll probably never do this again," and, and here <laughs> and we are you end again. Up doing yeah, it yeah, again. So we'll see. But you know, some of the books that of yours that I've really loved, uh, the Spiritual Freedom book is outstanding. Oh, and you. if anyone's looking for a great book, uh, that's a wonderful one. Maybe your most popular one is the, your your Camino yeah, experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's something about um, we we love to hear stories. We love a witness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's mm -hmm. what that's what gravitated me towards. Well, what kind of book do I want to read? I I like to read about St. Peter. You know, I'd, there's some, you know, like a how-to book, it, you know, is as exciting as an Ikea manual. But, like, when you hear that somebody is talking about their own journey or their own witness, well, St. Saint, uh, Saint Paul VI said this. He said that modern man listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers and mm -hmm. to teachers only if they're witnesses. If they're witnesses. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the books that uh, really rivet people, I, I think of uh, that incredible book by... Uh, Immaculate. I don't remember the name of it, yeah. but it was it was her experience in Rwanda. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my goodness! Can I just say for the record, um, who is now on our board of trustees? Is she? Isn't really? that fantastic? Yeah, that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, yeah, we asked her in in just a couple of weeks ago, and she was so thrilled. And oh, so much, but, that's yeah, amazing. If you don't know her story, you're right. Oh. But but Bob, your point is well taken, and it's interesting. I was at a conference this weekend giving some talks, mm -hmm. and somebody it's came what up, you do at a conference? Yeah, yeah. Or sometimes you attend. I, yeah. Actually, do you? I, I, no, no, I don't. Good, good <laughs> Me point, neither. Good point. Um, Last conference I attended was a Star Wars. Good conference. point. Um, well, somebody said, "I love your stories," and, mm -hmm. and I said, "Well, what is what is the things you remember most? Or stories, right? right? What, what does Jesus did? One time there was two men. There were. I mean, Jesus told yes. stories. You tell stories. Good preaching, good writing. That's not to say. Well, actually, there is something. There's a difference between teaching and preaching. Yeah. And preaching is often there has to be this connection to the person and the story and the experience. Um, some people would say that they're the same gift. They're not. Like, right. I, don't, I don't consider myself a great teacher. I'm, I don't know that I'm a great preacher either, but I'm better at preaching than I am teaching. Yeah, I'd say you're, and, a, great, and, 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 I'd say and, you're a great preacher. You. You, can, but, you can own that, dude. But you do both. You do both. Yeah. You know, you do. There, and, and there's a distinction between preaching and teaching that's different. But preaching, there's... Again, there's the story, there's the connection, there's the personalness, there's the intimacy, there's yes. the vulnerability, all of those kinds of things. Whereas you, 
teaching, you're not necessarily vulnerable. I think of it as teaching is really speaking to the mind yeah. about a particular subject, but preaching is speaking to the person. Works in the heart, yeah. In the, well, I would say... Or, or both. The, the entirety of their life, their, right. their heart, their mind, their soul, their strength, you know, like it's going to involve the mind to be sure, but uh, when I'm preaching, I am trying to speak to the whole person. When I'm teaching, yeah. it's That's because we're going over a certain topic in a class and you really need to understand this topic. I think it'll be a good foundation eventually to preach. I, I would say much of the ministry of catechesis is is that difference of yeah, there's some teaching involved, but I don't want them just to know the Ten Commandments. They need to live it. Yeah, How are they yeah, going to yeah, live yeah. it through witness, through proclamation, through the example of saints, through an encouragement and an accountability? I mean, really, that's the that's the true ministry of of catechesis. And and writing that stuff down. You know what I love about writing things down is, and, and this is maybe not the best thing to say about it. Well, it's. I feel like I can say it right. Like, I think yeah, we no, have no, the experience of we absolutely. give a talk, we come off, and the first thing I'm thinking of is, why didn't I say that? Wait, what did I just say? Uh, you know, I ran I out of time. This different, right, I could have right. But, like, there's a, there's a craftsmanship to the words that I can, and, and as you know, when you work on a book, and then you have an editor who comes back, and they're looking yeah, yeah, at yeah. it, and, like, every sentence is scrutinized. There's something really vulnerable about writing because you put it oh, out there yeah. and, you know, the, the edit process where they get back and they're like, did you really mean to say that? <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I didn't. But did then you it's, really it's, mean to suggest there was a quadrinity? But, but, uh. but it's, it's, it's kind of out there and, and it can be cut and paste and people can shoot at it. Yeah, it's, right. yeah there's something about that. That's, yeah. I think um, we, every generation laments how each one is less literate than the one before. Mm. And... In a world of Instagram stories and TikTok reels, um, it's a challenge actually to get people to even read. I find that sadly, even with, I mean, with my students, yeah, no, absolutely, just getting them to read, and you know, like pages, not just like pages, yeah, like yeah, turning exactly. actual pages and studying. And uh, we don't live in a society that encourages or even or even rewards that. No, and you're absolutely right. That's why I'm excited when books get popular. It doesn't matter what the book is. I mean, I guess it does matter what the book is, but the fact that people will buy books and read them, like the Harry Potter series, for mm-hmm. example, mm-hmm. that showed a whole generation that you can you can read a book. Kids you can read, read if, you can read a yet. thick yeah, book, yeah, yeah, you know? Yeah. And um, at least there's a positiveness to that because so much of what we have in our faith comes from the scriptures. Mm-hmm. You know, it comes from the Bible. It comes from the written word. The written yeah, word. Yeah. It's living, but it's on the page, and we turn these pages. And... And I think in many ways, um, you know, a society that's very anti-God wants to keep books out of our hands. And uh, it's important that we, particularly with the scriptures and other, other great writings, just take time to, to open up the books. You know, we, have, we live in an information age, quote-unquote, and we're dumber than ever. We what? have so much information yeah, 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 at yeah. our fingertips, none of it's in our brain. And if you could think of, like, you know, I do a course in church history— the levels people went for scholarship just to find a book. I mean, yeah, they would yeah, go to yeah, Ireland yeah, to a yeah, monastery, yeah, yeah. and now you can Google everything and get the quote-unquote answer. You know, Google doesn't give you wisdom. It just gives you in information, information yeah, and yeah. there's a huge difference between What's your things. favorite non-spiritual religious book? Oh, wait a second. I was going to say the screw tape letters, but that's spiritual. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. I was, outside of the Bible, in terms of like a, a book that rocked my world, and I still screw go back tape to letters. Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Yeah, yeah. Now you're just talking about like fiction. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ender's Game. Okay. By Orson Scott Card. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. an incredible sci-fi book. Um, I mean, there, there's a handful of them, I would say, that are the, the non-negotiable. Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead, which is the sequel. Dune by Frank Herbert. Mm-hmm. Not the movie, but the book is incredible. Uh, Hobbit. Uh, is a huge one. I never, uh, I, I came to C.S. Lewis like the the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe series a little bit late in life. I didn't so read good. them as a kid. I think they're okay. <laughs> I do. I think they're okay. I love the imagery of them. They're gorgeous. They're beautiful. And, and yeah. anathema to anyone who says anything. Wow. Other than that. Yeah. Wow. No, I think they're okay. They're, they're a bit too much on the nose for me. You know exactly Whatever. the biblical imagery that's going on. They're beautiful, and Whatever. they've got beautiful things. In them. Hey, wait a second. I started with the C.S. Lewis book at the top of my list, so I, I don't feel like he's upset with me. Clive Staples he is giving be. me a thumbs up from heaven right he now as we be. speak. He might be. Yeah. Okay, um, so— But what about yourself? Well, that's just— I, Actually, I came to the Lord of the—not Lord of the—I never read the Lord of the Rings books. The um, Chronicles of Narnia, 
Mm-hmm. I read those not that long ago, like eight or nine years ago. I thought they were gorgeous and beautiful. Mm-hmm. There's a book called Pillars of the Earth. It's a really good book, although there's a couple of scenes that are a little tough. But it's um, it's about the building of a cathedral in the Middle Ages. It's a huge book. It's like 1,200 pages. Wow. But just the relationship between the church. I mean, families, generation after generation after generation, give themselves to the building of this cathedral. It's just really an interesting, fascinating and read. And your families and, and your children. With a thousand generations. So, but yeah, it's great. It's... Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I don't even know what, like, what would be that one book? I mean, obviously the scripture, if I was on yeah. an island, I don't know. I would say the Harry I don't read books twice. I think you do. Uh, some I will, but generally not. Okay, I'll okay. watch movies a few times. Yeah, but, yeah, but I won't I would say the Harry Potter right. series yeah. was incredible. I actually watched, I read all of them in the course of 10 days um, because I came back from Haiti, I had a parasite, and I was in the bathroom a lot, and I just... For ten days, I just okay. Met. We we you didn't need the visual, we didn't need that. but it was no, it was no, actually it's it's an amazing it's amazing scope that. of literature. We did not need uh, that. What about like um, religiousy books that aren't the Bible that you were really inspired by? Well, one that I've I've spoken of time and time again is uh, Henry Nouwen's Return of the Prodigal Son, mm. which is just a really really beautiful book. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so, some of the classics. You know, I, I remember... Abandonment to Divine Providence. Yeah, yeah, That's a fantastic book. Cassard, Jean-Claude yeah, Van Damme. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, I remember I read uh, Augustine's Confessions as a novice that was really powerful. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Have you read but, Quo Vadis? No. It's cool. It's a, it's a fiction yeah, yeah, book, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. set in the time period. It's really cool. Yeah. Have but you I, read Between the Savior and the Sea? Um, I'm waiting for the movie. Well, it's already Apparently on. Apparently, it's out there. It's, it's, it's called. It's already Chisholm. out there, but again, I'm not legally allowed to talk okay, about. Okay, so this. we have to go quick to our third section. Fatima's coming up. Yeah, tell me about Fatima. I've never I been. Love Fatima. So I've been. Uh, it's funny. Fatima is probably my favorite place as far as the Marian apparitions. Really? And it's funny because I tell people that, and they go to Fatima. It's like, oh, it's not as nice <laughs> as I thought it was going to be. It's not as beautiful as yeah. as Lords. Um, it's different than Guadalupe. I mean, all I've been to. And most we're saying this because Our Lady Fatima is this Saturday. Right, right. right? I, I've been or to most like of the Marian pilgrimage, you know, significant marriage Marian pilgrimage sites, and and I say Fatima. First off, um, I I never remember the years, nineteen seventeen or eighteen or something like that. Those I just don't remember that kind of thing because I can just Google it and find it right, out. Right, exactly. Right, yeah, yeah. I don't have to remember anything. But um, Our Lady appeared to three kids: Jacinta, Francesco, and Lucia. And that's one of the things I love about the story is the children and they're part of the story. And then she's inviting us to pray against uh, this Russia. When, and at the time in 1917, it's like, who's Russia? And as it turns out, obviously it comes out to be significant. Um, but the thing I love about um, Fatima, and it's the part that you can't explain, is that I had an encounter with Our Lady at Fatima that was hmm. different than any place else. So when I tell people, oh, Fatima's my favorite, they, they'll go there and it's beautiful and the story's beautiful, but it's not necessarily the most beautiful place. Or, yes. But there was just the presence of Is Our Lady there. Is it just a field? Like yeah. What, what's there today? If you if oh, I went just, to if I went to yeah, Fatima, yeah. what would I see? Um, a massive, massive courtyard uh, with they've just built a new church. The church where the apparition was, the church where the kids are buried, uh, in this and they do a procession. So it's very, yeah. It's in the middle of a little town. It's not beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. You wouldn't see it. It's not like Lords with a beautiful stream and these right. fields and mountains. Or it's like, or, a, or, or like Magic or, or Guadalupe. It's very. Right. It's kind of, but are there gift shops? Yes, of course there are. But it's not as much as Lords. <laughs> like I call that Merry World, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, Come to and, Mary and, and world. she's saying, you know, pray for peace. Um, and she said that, yeah, it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful image. And the thing I love about it is, again, the children. One of the. They're, they're having this image or this apparition. They're speaking to Mary, and they're talking about, am I going to go to heaven? Am I going to go to heaven? And little Francisco was maybe eight or nine, ten years old. I don't, know, I don't remember what he was. And they said, is Francesco going to go to heaven? And Mary says, Francesco needs to pray a lot of rosaries. Because <laughs> they were just praying. They were doing their rosaries. Instead of doing all the prayers, they were just saying, Hail Mary, Hail Mary, Hail what Mary. A, what a mother. That's, saying, the, that's yeah, the thing yeah. a mother would exactly, say. Exactly. Yeah, you need to pray. I'm not going to I'm not gonna guarantee anything. You yeah, need to so pray it's, a, it's just a, it's a beautiful message. And, yeah, again, there there's something unique about all of the Marian pilgrimage sites. But on a personal level, just the encounter I had with Our Lady at that will always make it unique for me. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's have you been at beautiful. what pilgrimage sites oh, or Marian gosh. pilgrimage sites have you been to? 
None. None. Okay, we have to do Guadalupe because it's. Our I would love backyard. to do. Okay. I would love to do Guadalupe. Right, yeah, good. that's the that's the closest one. My son just went to uh, Fatima, which sounds great. I I actually just haven't been. It's funny. I'm everywhere and nowhere. I don't travel, like I just don't get out and do pilgrimage. Yeah, I need yeah. to. I mean, the, the best the best pilgrimage experiences for me have been in the Holy Land, and yeah, actually, yeah. this ties back to what we we're saying earlier. You know, I not only got to go to the Holy Land on a couple tours, but um, I also uh, just went by myself right, when right, I was researching right. the book. So I'm going to recant this statement, and I'm going to say my my favorite Marian uh, pilgrimage was in Nazareth. Nazareth. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're not that, wrong about that. That uh, the Church of the Annunciation. Yeah, you're and, not wrong. It's pretty beautiful. Oh my gosh! If you haven't been there, it's a, like a little house with it. It's like a church built around a house. Yeah. And um, one of the neat things, we can kind of close with this, one of the beautiful things about the Holy Land is they have a lot of Latin inscriptions for things. And, um, but one of the, in Latin, the word here is hic, and they have that everywhere. And so on the bottom of the floor there, they had the inscription in Latin, the word became flesh, and then they added here, yeah, yeah. which is cool. So that's my, that's, and I, I just I remember I just uh, even getting yeah, chills yeah, yeah, just yeah, thinking yeah. of that that space. It there's something beautiful about walking to physical places where God has done incredible Absolutely. things, Absolutely. and that's such an important part of pilgrimage. Just like the Camino, and Amen. you can buy Father Dave's book. Amen. And whatever wherever fine books are sold. Lord, we ask your blessing to be upon uh, all those listening that they know your peace. And Our Lady Fatima, pray for us. Lord bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, I bet you enjoyed this episode. I bet you did. Uh, feel free to send an email, angry emails to Father Dave Pavanka at hope at franciscan.edu. That's hope, hope at franciscan.edu. God bless everybody. Happy graduation, everybody. Oh, yeah. We'll talk about that next week. All right.